Hi, I'm Amanda Piquet. Welcome to this series on Neuroimmunology Nuggets. Neuroimmunology Nuggets is an educational program that was developed with patients in mind to provide a focused or digestible topic uh, in neuroimmunology and autoimmune neurology. For this particular episode, we will be discussing what is autoimmune neurology. So first, before we dive into what is autoimmune neurology, we need to review some basics of the immune system to understand how the interplay between the immune system and the nervous system can cause autoimmune disease. There are two main parts of the immune system, including the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is what you are born with and will fight off any foreign bug or infection right away and acts as the first defense that is seen here in the purple circle. Your adaptive immune system consists of two main types of cells, including B and T cells seen here in the pink circle. The adaptive immune system is created in response to an exposure and can take a couple of weeks to kick in. However, when it does become activated, the response is very specific and aimed at an offending target, such as an illness. So I wanna bring your attention now to the B cells uh, seen here in red. These cells create antibodies. What is an antibody? An antibody is an immune globulin or protein that is produced by the immune system to help fight off infection. So when the immune system misbehaves, then antibodies are created by the immune system that can attack yourself instead of a virus or an infection, hence autoimmune disease. Autoimmune neurologic diseases are antibody mediated diseases. And here on this graph, I kind of show you the landscape of neuronal autoantibody discovery, which is rapidly expanding. Sometimes these antibodies serve as biomarkers or signals of the disease, and sometimes they can cause a direct attack on the brain or spinal cord itself. Now, the idea of perineoplastic or an immune-mediated mechanism causing a neurologic syndrome in the setting of cancer for other causes was actually first described in the 19th century. But it wasn't until 1965 that Dr. Wilkinson and colleagues discovered a neuronal antibody in four patients with a small cell lung cancer and a sensory neuropathy. In the 1980s, additional studies began describing specific neuronal antibodies found in the context of different antibody syndromes. And in 1983, doctors Greenlee and Bershear identified another Purkinje cell antibody in patients with an ovarian cancer and cerebellar degeneration. Then in 1985, the group with Dr. Posner at Memorial Sloan Kettering Center began describing different perineoplastic neurologic syndromes in patients. And this definition of perineoplastic means an antibody produced with an underlying cancer. In 2004, another landmark year, neuromyelitis optica or NMO spectrum disease was described in the setting of a positive aquaporin-4 antibody with Dr. Van der Lennen at the Mayo Clinic. This was one of the first examples of an autoantibody that was truly pathogenic, meaning that antibody itself was directly attacking the brain or the spinal cord. The field of autoimmune neurology, specifically our understanding of autoimmune encephalitis, then exploded after the discovery of NMDA receptor encephalitis in 2017, or sorry, 2007. Can I repeat that? The field of autoimmune neurology, specifically our understanding of autoimmune encephalitis, then exploded after the discovery of NMDA receptor encephalitis in 2007 described by Professor Dalmau's group in the setting of four young women who developed a syndrome of memory deficits, psychiatric symptoms, and decreased level of consciousness, and later developed hypoventilation, and they were all found to have ovarian teratomas. Subsequently, an MDA receptor encephalitis was later described not only in women with ovarian teratomas, but in children, men, and women without an underlying cancer. Now, beyond just NMDA receptor encephalitis, other antibodies against cell surface and synaptic antigens have been identified with increasing 
frequency. And these are all seen on this picture in red. The discovery of these cell surface antibodies have really shaped the landscape of autoimmune neurology. And it is now recognized that many of these antibody syndromes can be readily treatable with immune modulatory therapy. Additionally, the discovery of new neural autoantibodies have revealed that these conditions are much more common than previously appreciated, and oftentimes patients are misdiagnosed or remain undiagnosed. This figure here highlights the different mechanisms of antibody-mediated syndromes. In panel A, in the black box, this shows an intracellular antibody or target, for example, anti-HU. These antibody syndromes are classically thought to be perineoplastic syndromes, often related to an underlying cancer. It is thought that they largely represent a T-cell mediated process and are often harder to treat with immune suppressing medications. Now in red or panel C highlighted here, these are your cell surface antibody syndromes. A great example is NMDA receptor encephalitis. And here you have antibodies targeting an antigen on the cell surface at the receptor level causing receptor dysfunction. These antibodies have a direct effect on the function of the nerve, so it's thought they respond better to immune therapy. In gray or panel B, here in the middle, are your less common intracellular synaptic syndromes. For example, GAD65. GAD65 antibody syndrome has a wide variety of neurologic syndromes, including stiff person syndrome, encephalitis, cerebellar ataxia, and epilepsy, or seizure disorders. Stay tuned for a future nugget dedicated to this antibody. So what part of the nervous system is affected by autoimmune neurologic disease? Well, really it can be any part of the neuroaccess. So starting with the brain, you have your brain um, and uh, encephalitis, uh, the, the definition is inflammation of the brain. So when this is affected, you can see problems with thinking and memory. Seizures are a very common presentation. Uh, the cerebellum is the balanced part of the brain and when involved can cause problems with walking and vision impairment. And many times patients present with balance issues, tremors or movement disorders. When the basal ganglia is involved in the deep part of the brain here, um, we can see uh, problems again with movement disorders. We can see jumpy, jerking movements. Maybe it's hard to control or we see slow movements. Again, things like tremors or maybe things that can mimic Parkinson's disease. You can get the brainstem involvement causing a brainstem encephalitis. There is one particular syndrome called opsoclonus myoclonus, which is a disorder that causes jumpy eye movements um, as well as jumpy movements within the bodies. When the brainstem is affected, other symptoms you could see are, include double vision, weakness, and swallowing problems. When the visual system is impaired, uh, it can include problems with the eye itself or the optic nerve and result in retinopathies or optic neuropathies. Taking a look at the spinal cord here, when there's spinal cord involvement or inflammation in the spinal cord, that's defined as myelitis. Uh, symptoms that can result from this are weakness, sensory changes, bladder or bowel problems. Now we're going to take a look at this spinal cord here in cross section and coming out from the spinal cord, you have nerves that exit and this is part of the peripheral nervous system. Common disorders um, that can affect the peripheral nervous system include, include problems with the nerve root itself as it exits. And this would be called perineoplastic radiculopathies or neuropathies. You can have problems within the sensory ganglion here uh, called sensory ganglionopathies. These um, disorders that affect the sensory ganglion can cause significant sensory impairment, which often leads to loss of coordination because you have that loss of sensory input that helps control your movements. Very rarely can there be mimics of the anterior horn disorders such as ALS 
again, very rare. And then moving out to the nerve itself, like I said, you can have peripheral neuropathies. There is a communication between the nerve and the muscle itself, and that's called the neuromuscular junction. When that is involved, you can get syndromes such as myasthenia gravis or Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome. And then lastly, you can have involvement of the muscle itself. And when you have inflammation affecting the muscle, that is called myositis. So lastly, let's not forget about the autonomic nervous system. When the autonomic nervous system is involved, you can see problems with uh, dysautonomia, and that includes blood pressure changes, heart rate changes, uh, gastrointestinal involvement, uh, sometimes complete loss of sweating, as well as bladder and bowel dysfunction. So how do patients present? Well, autoimmune and perineoplastic disease can really masquerade as traditional neurologic syndromes and have so many wide varieties of presentations. Uh, in fact, autoimmune neurology intersects with multiple subspecialties in neurology and patients can show up to other clinics and various subspecialties, including epilepsy or seizure disorders cognitive and behavioral changes, including rapidly progressive dementia type pictures, uh, neuromuscular disease, as I showed, it can, uh, it can cause neuropathies and myopathies, as well as movement disorders, including syndromes that can look very similar to Parkinson's disease that we call Parkinsonism, or, or extra movements called uh, choreiform movements, um, or difficulty walking. I hope you enjoyed this introductory talk on what is autoimmune neurology. Stay tuned for other nuggets in the series on topics within autoimmune neurology and neuroimmunology. Thank you again.